What's up, guys? Welcome to the Front Row Dads podcast. Today, I want to talk about world schooling and a victory that I had over the past week with my nine-year-old son, Tiger. Hey, if you're new to this show, welcome to the Front Row Dads podcast. I'm your host, John Vroman, and this is the place for high-performing entrepreneurial men to gather uh, so that they can share best practices and learn about how to be amazing family men with businesses not businessmen with families. And so if that resonates with you, I'm really glad that you're here. Today, we're doing something a little different than our normal Tuesday show, which is always an interview with these epic men. Uh, we just had Marcus Sheridan and Andrew Newman, upcoming Charlie Engel is gonna be on the show, who ran across the Sahara Desert literally 111 days in a row, two marathons a day. We're gonna talk to him about persistence and overcoming adversity. He's a father, and so we're relating it to that world. And uh, I've got to tell you that today's episode, I want to talk to you a little bit about this adventure that I had with my son and the things that I learned that were great, that I would do a million times over, and that things that I, uh, where I feel I might have failed along the way. So I want to tell you guys what happened and take a little peek behind the scenes. And if you're in a place where you're interested in perhaps traveling with your kids, whether that's for a day trip or a longer extended trip, I think you'll get a lot of value out of the show. But even if you're not, the principles I'm talking about here will apply to you as well. And I'll give you an example of this. So one of the things that I'll, I'll get right into the first idea I want to share with you today, which is about turning the world into your classroom. When I left on this trip, I said, how can I make every part of this experience with my son, Tiger, an opportunity to learn? So as an example of that, we got to the airport and rather than doing everything for Tiger, I let him get involved in almost every step of the way. I had him check in on the kiosk and hand the ID and the tickets to the TSA agent. I had him navigate all the signs and ultimately handed over the responsibility to him to get us to the gate. I had him look at the sign and tell us what time we needed to be on the plane. If we were going to go walk and get a snack to set a timer to make sure that we made it back to the plane on time. I just allowed for this to be an opportunity for him to really step up. And then I saw through that his confidence growing. Now, I want to give credit to my buddy Dan Martell, who said something in his interview on this show. And if you haven't heard his interview, you should go back and listen to that. But he talked about how that we're all homeschooling our kids, whether we realize it or not. And for years, I used to think I sent my son away to, for his education. And honestly, I couldn't even tell you what they were doing in school. I didn't know the curriculum. I didn't know what he was really learning. I, I just looked at that as like outsourcing. Like, hey, that's one thing I don't have to think about. The school can handle that. But Dan really challenged my thinking on this. And I said, how can I be more involved in my son's education? How can I turn all of our opportunities, our, our time together into opportunities for growth, right? In a fun way. And uh, honestly, Tiger loves it. You know, he, uh, I mean, occasionally he'll get annoyed with me that I keep asking him to do something, but it's really empowering for him to have this choice and make these decisions and learn about the world, which is really cool. So um, that was a really fun part of the trip. And that showed up all throughout the five days. Like as an example, we went to this amazing store in Rapid City, South Dakota called Shields, like a big sports store. And as we're walking in, I see this statue of, there's a Thomas Jefferson and a George Washington statue. And next to it is this bronze, you know, written story about who they were and what they did in the world. And I said, let's just stop and read that together. And I realized that so many things around us are opportunities to learn about business, you know, about customer service, about history. If you look around and just ask yourself, how does each and every moment become this learning experience for everybody? And I enjoyed it too, because as we read signs and talked about things, uh, we were all growing. And I'll share with you one conversation we had on the way down from a big hike a little bit later in this in this show. And I'll keep this quick, by the way. So if you're listening, it'll probably be you know uh, 10 to 15 minutes ish. At least that's the goal. And uh, you might want to take the over on that. <laughs> so uh, you know that was one part, right? How do we turn every experience into a classroom? How do we look at education as an entire process of the minute that we wake up until the minute that we go to bed and every interaction, every engagement, they're you know, my son is watching me talk to people in the world and learning how to engage with the world. He's watching me handle problems that show up. And I had a big failure there at the end of the trip, which I'll share uh, at the end of this show as well. But I had a big failure. And I'll tell you about that, where I just totally lost my, lost my mind <laughs> and, and, uh, and was not a good example of emotional mastery, which is one of our pillars of Front Row Dads. 
But, uh, you know, so, so that's number one. Let me share with you number two. Number two realization for me about this trip with Tiger was the power of sharing our daily rituals. Now, I live with Tiger, so you'd think this could be part of our routine already. But the reality is that even in our home, a lot of what happens uh, in our home is separate. So as an example, I would normally put Tiger to bed, and then my routine is to sit you know, before I go to sleep and complete my five-minute journal. And I, that would be my practice, right? To review the day and document highlight moments and put a picture of the day in the journal. And it's just an online app, by the way, which I highly recommend. And on this trip, because we're staying in the same hotel, I'm laying there in bed. And we're going to bed at the same time, which was great. And I, I just said, Tiger, I said, hey, why don't we do this journal together? And what I realized at the end of five days was every morning and every night, we did the five-minute journal together. And it was way cooler to do this with him where we selected the photograph and we talked about what we're grateful for and we reviewed our highlight moments of the day, what made the day awesome, what could have made the day better. And by asking my son these questions, I learned more about him and he learned more about me, but we also started to generate a new routine between the two of us and it was really cool. So that was an example of how spending time together for five days in the same hotel from morning until night the rituals of the day were more integrated than ever before. Uh, you know, another one would be, I usually do yoga before he wakes up or I'm stretching before he wakes up or stretching after he goes to bed again. And I decide, you know, in this particular case, he watched me do yoga. He watched me work out. He watched me, you know, get my exercise in throughout the day. In other words, he rarely gets to see me work. He rarely gets to see me sit and focus and then jump up and do some exercising. He's always at school and I'm doing my work. So the opportunity that we both had to learn about each other's rituals and uh, you know routines, if you will, how we operate through the day was so very powerful. And so that was a big one for me, sharing these daily rituals. And I know that I was in a positive way, very influential in his life, but also learning about his, you know, flow throughout the day, how he operates throughout the day. It was also very good for me. Uh, third, I want to tell you about the fact that we were there for business. That was the purpose of the trip originally. Then it extended to be the purpose of he and I getting some extra days to go hiking and explore the city. But I did have an opportunity to give a keynote speech to uh, an event called, it was an event called Day of Excellence. And thanks to my amazing friends there in Rapid City, uh, Eric Heiser, Chris and Wavy, all these incredible people who brought me in to speak at the 10th annual Day of Excellence event. It was just fantastic. 1,630 people, amazing audience. Tiger was sitting right there in the audience. I was telling stories about him. The audience gave him a round of applause, which that was a first of, in his world. And I think it was really cool for Tiger to see me in that space. That was the first time he's ever seen me deliver a keynote like that with that size group. And I think it was a big, I'm going to guess, it was a what we call in this community a front row moment for Tiger, no doubt. Like I imagine he'll remember that experience. He'll remember meeting people. And some really cool things happened that day, by the way. So after my speech, I'm signing books and people are meeting Tiger. He's standing right there with me. And uh, he ends up, they ask him to sign a couple of books, which I thought, gosh, how cool are these moments in Tiger's life? Now, I don't know what they'll all mean to him down the road, but I do know he was being treated very well. I know that he was being lifted, uh, you know, uplifted. He was being elevated by people who saw the best in him, uh, were very complimentary of him about how engaged and present he was. They were reinforcing some values that I really appreciate. So I thought that was really, really cool. So Tiger got a chance to listen to me speak. And then the second day, by the way, I had a second keynote to a company called Black Hills Energy. And Tiger sat front row again. He then, there's a part of that speech where I have everybody in the audience turn to somebody and interview each other. They're asking questions and listening and learning about one another. And Tiger participated in that. He's right there in the front row having this conversation with a wonderful man, 42 years old, who I uh, who I'd met. And or at least I, I, I think I just made up his age, by the way. I was going to say he's a man probably in his 40s. But he, um, he was sitting there talking with Tiger and they were really engaging. They had a really great conversation. And I really appreciate it. So by the way, if, uh, if, if you, by the way, are out there listening and you were the one engaged with my sons uh, with my son in the front row having that conversation, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It was really wonderful. And I did get your email, by the way, to uh, follow up uh, with the photograph. And so thank you for that. 
But I got to tell you that those events, those keynotes, those, those opportunities for Tiger to be present with my work, I thought was really cool because it also gave us things to talk about. And let me tell you about one of my dad failures. <laughs> so in my presentation, I, I tell a story um, about uh, treating people as if it might be the last day of their life. And I talk about how that causes me to be more present with Tiger when I think about my time in, uh, in that way, knowing that, there's, that, that I have only so much time in life to connect with my son. And we all have an, an, an end, right? There's a deadline for all of us at the end of our life. And when I realize that, I get more present. I get more purposeful with my minutes because they're more cherished, because I know that I'm reminded that there's not an infinite amount of moments there that, that I can uh, capture in life. And I'm walking with Tiger through the woods on this hike and I'm on my phone. Now, I'm actually doing something that's serving both of us. I'm, I'm actually scheduling something for later in the day. But uh, Tiger sees that and he says, hey, you know, and he challenges me. He says, hey, during your speech, you talk about not being on your phone and being present with me. And there's a part of me that really got angry in that moment because I was like, you little ungrateful kid, you know, like I'm doing this for you. And what I, what we, what that, his comment to me though said two things. Number one, I love that he has the courage to challenge me in that way. I love that we have a relationship that he can be that honest with me and question, you know, something that in his mind, hey, I said I was going to be present and here I am on the phone. And he doesn't know what I'm doing. Now, I was able to explain to him what I was doing on the phone, which then, of course, he understood and appreciated, but it caused a conversation between us. And if you trace that all the way back, it's because he started to understand my values. He understood the message that I was communicating. He was confused about it. We had a good dialogue and we both walked away better people for the conversation. So I thought that was really, really cool. So it, it, it showed me a gap in my dad game where I have to not just assume that he knows I'm doing something resourceful on my phone. Maybe I want to communicate that. Hey, buddy, uh, I, I want to be fully present with you. I just need to look up something for five minutes on my phone so I can plan the thing for later. So uh, let me just handle this real quick. I'll be right back would have probably handled that situation better than if I just check out and start looking at my phone. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where somebody else has checked out looking at their phone and you don't know, are they doing something that's, are they checking text messages or are they doing something that's critically important, right? So being aware for me um, uh, was a big takeaway there of, of to noticing how I could easily check out and not tell him what was going on. All right, so along that same hike, let me get to my fourth big idea here, which this is a seven and a half mile hike that we did this one day. Epic hike. My son's nine, by the way, and I just was so proud of him for doing this. Now, he's done big hikes like this before. I knew he was very capable, yet still a good bit of distance to cover for anybody, but we had an awesome time. There's a couple of things I learned on, the, on that hike. Number one, I, I learned again, I'm relearning this, that my son loves adventure. You know, when we're on the trail, he's having one experience. But if we decide to go off the trail a little bit, I remember he said to me like, oh, he goes, I love this adventure. I love going off the trail with you, dad, because what I, what I am reminded of about especially what people in general, but like little boys might have this even more if I were to stereotype for a moment is that, uh, you know, they, they want an adventure. They want risk. Now, my wife, by the way, and many other women that I know enjoy adventure and risk too. That's certainly not a statement that says that's not the case. Um, but when you start watching and learning about your children, let's not even identify whether it's a boy or a girl or however you want to identify. The point is about noticing values in your children emerging. And one of the things I see in Tiger is he loves to go off the trail. He loves the risk. He wants to walk near the edge. He wants to feel that. He wants to feel brave and important. Uh, I would notice that when we would video, send a video message home to mom, one of the things I noticed was that he wanted mom to know he was adventuring. So he would record the videos like, yeah, mom, like we're having a great time. We're on this trail. You know, we got we got s some cliffs here, you know, maybe a thousand feet high. Like he was dropping these things out there to mom to say, I'm brave, I'm bold, I'm adventuring. Like and I was telling my wife, Tatiana, how much I noticed that he craves mom's, uh, you know, engagement in his life. Almost like he almost wanted to do it to get mom 
you know, I, I don't know if upset is the word or worried or whatever, but like that's an energy, right? Like, and like when you're worried about somebody, you're engaged with that person. When he commands attention, whether it's like he's taking a risk, he tells mom he's taking a risk, mom responds with great energy, right, around it, that all feels alive, right? It feels alive. And I just know, I just saw it so much more clearly than I ever have before these needs that we have in our lives and how we crave this attention from our parents and we crave the response and how we'll even, you know, manufacture a little bit of the the story to get even a bigger response, to get a rise out of somebody because that rise is like an extra bit of energy to the conversation. So I just noticed this and I now we could give that a hundred meanings. Right. But noticing it allows us some power that may not exist if we don't notice it. That awareness brings a certain amount of enlightenment to our world so that we can know our children better, know how they interact with us. What are the needs that they're really trying to meet along the way? What are they really chasing? Right. Are they are they are they trying to be really manipulative or are they just trying to connect at a higher level? Are they trying to use the tools they have to get more connected to mom and dad, to get more attention from mom and dad, to get more praise or whatever it is, whether it's positive or negative, it's still connection time, right? So I just noticed that about my son. And the other thing that happened on this walk, and this will be the last thing I share with you about this hike, is that on the way down, uh, we talked about sex. We, we, I don't remember how exactly the conversation came up, but one of the things that I've been learning about, guys, is that you know when do we have the sex talk with our kids? And the point is, it's never just one talk. It's right like there's little pieces of this this talk, if you will, that happen all throughout, you know, our exist our time with our kids. Right. Like we're just always having the conversation whenever it's the right time to have the conversation. Sometimes you might bring it up. Sometimes they might bring it up. Now, my son's nine. He's going to turn 10 this summer. But, you know, look, they, they had a, a program at school where they talked about, uh, you know, sexuality and, you know, this is he had questions about it. And here's how I handled it. And I wanted to tell you guys, after I went through this program, this birds and the bees program, that one of the things I took away, here's my whole takeaway from it was just be matter of fact. Right. And it's not a big deal. Just answer the questions. And I told Tiger, I said, look, I'm just going to answer these questions matter of factly. Like we he, so he's like, hey, how does how does this work and how does that work? And. I'm just explaining like, hey, there's a penis, there's a vagina, there's, you know, like I'm just explaining it all. We talked about everything. You know, how does the how does the baby get made? And and can women who are married to other women have babies and can men who are married to other men? Like we t it, literally we almost covered it all. And I just was said to Tiger, I go, hey, now I, I, I always told you that I'd be really honest with you. Right. Like I want I will tell you the truth. I will tell you I want you to be educated. I want you to know these things. And at the same time, I said, now, I wouldn't go tell all your friends all of what you learned. And here's why. Because your friends, parents might want to tell them. In fact, they likely do. And those kids should be able to learn from their parents at the time that their parents want them to know all this. Now, you have the information. That's wonderful. But I said, please don't just go tell all your buddies because then we'll probably all be sitting around with their parents and having a conversation. And let's not go there. But I, I do want you to be educated. I want you to know because you're asking and I'm going to tell you the truth. And it was great. It was a, I saw his confidence build through this conversation and it was awesome. And I walked away saying, man, that feels so good. I don't think that conversation would have taken place if it wasn't for the three days that we spent before that. And it wasn't for that extra long hike, that seven and a half mile hike that was hours and hours and hours. And I don't know that we would have created the psychological safety and the opportunity for that conversation to emerge if we wouldn't have had such an immersive experience together on this trip. So I wanted to share that with you because I think it was really cool. And I didn't bring it up. He did, which was really cool. So we got to talk about it on his terms, which I thought was uh, was really a nice perk. All right, guys, last couple things and then I'm out. How am I doing on time? Ah, I went over. I'm at 19 minutes. Here we go. All right, last couple final things here. One is that uh, you know I learned uh, from my son that, that there were patterns of behavior. And here's an example. I paid so much attention to his mood and behavior all throughout the day that I noticed whenever we would a talk about sugar or sweets, his mood would change. More frantic, more energy, or when he would have a sweet or a treat, because at the beginning of the trip, we did more sweets and treats than normal. It was kind of fun, and it was I was in a yes mood, and I'm like, yeah, we can have dessert, and yeah, and you know, listen, my son, he's grown up in a house where health is a highest priority, or, or a very high priority, I should say. 
And like, I'll give you an example. Like I think Tiger at 10 has literally consumed, I'm not even joking, less than a dozen sodas in his entire life. We just, we don't have it in the house. We never get it. Or I shouldn't say never. We rarely ever get it. Clearly he's had maybe a dozen sodas in his entire life. He's 10 years old. Uh, and by the way, that's, uh, that's just a personal decision we made as a family that we were not going to do that. Now he's had other desserts. He's had other candy. He goes trick or treating. So this isn't a perfect system, right? By any means. But I've noticed that when I, you know, say, Hey, yes to dessert or yes to that candy. And on this trip, there was even yes to a Sprite that, uh, that I notice a change in behavior. And it's like literally if somebody were drunk, right? If somebody were drunk and you're like, get it together, man. You would realize if they couldn't get it together. You'd realize if they couldn't stop slurring their words, if they're hammered, right? They couldn't drive a car, even if you demand, I, I demand you sober up and drive that car and be responsible. They could not. And when a child has a massive amount of sugar in their body, their body's out of control, right? They're on a drug and their bodies are out of control. And it's literally like a person on a mind altering substance where I had to recognize that some of his behavior was like, I look at him and go, hey, we got to, you know, hey, step up. Like, how is it, you know, in my brain or sometimes I would say versions of this, but it's like, how would a nine-year-old act, right? Like he would re regress to like a four or five-year-old on certain occasions. And I'm like, who is this child, right? But I recognize that a lot of this had to do with the foods that were going in his mouth or it's not, you know, these were the sugars that were going in his mouth that were causing this incredible behavior shift for him. I noticed that pattern. So if I wouldn't have spent so much time with him, I don't think, listen, I've known this all the way along that sugar causes, you know, a, a shift in personality, of course, but to see it in the, in the, uh, the light that I did because of the context was really important. All right, guys. Uh, on the topic of health, by the way, my next point is we introduced a health day. So we did some treats and some sweets uh, the first couple of days. But then the third day, there was no sugar. No, we had a healthy breakfast. We had a healthy lunch. We had a healthy dinner. And we had no dessert. And we went to bed. And I think it was good for me to be able to explain to Tiger the balance of, hey, there's nothing wrong with having pancakes every now and then. There's nothing wrong with a little dessert every now and then. But we also need to make sure that our we're taking care of ourselves uh, in a healthy way, and let's do that today. And so we did, and that was a day we had no screen time, no treats, we read, we ate healthy, we exercised, we worked, and we got it done. So we mixed in that, and we talked about balance. That was a real victory. All right, guys, here's the, the last part, which is the epic failure of the trip, which kind of happened towards the end. So we're, we're hiking all day, we get back to the hotel room, and I walk in and the bed's not made. And I thought they didn't actually clean the whole room. But what ended up happening was because there was a backpack on the bed, the hotel didn't make the bed. Now, I remember I asked the, the, the maid who was in the hallway or the housekeeper in the hallway. I said, hey, is there a reason why the bed didn't get made? And she said, oh, yeah, because the backpack was there. I said, wait a minute. So there's one small backpack on the bed. But that that literally is the reason they wouldn't just move the backpack. She goes, no hotel policy. And for whatever reason, long day, <laughs> out of my mind, for some reason, that was a really big deal to me in that moment. And, and, I, and there's this personality within me that uh, my, I call and others affectionately <laughs> refer to, my wife calls, Officer Roman. When I think it's my job to like set some rules in the world or bring attention to other people when things aren't right. So I immediately picked up the phone and I called out of the front desk and I go, can I understand something like... You know, and, and by the way, at this point, I'm probably being a little bit of an asshole, you know, a little bit sarcastic, maybe a lot. I don't know. Probably a lot. Anyway, I'm, I'm trying to keep it cool. I'm trying to be nice. But you know how that goes, right? When you're trying to be nice, but you're really coming across like a jerk. Well, I'm like, is that really the policy? Like, is that true? Like, there's one backpack. They literally won't go move it to the side one feet, one foot and then make the bed. That's it. Uh, and I just was so wanting to walk back into a room that was just put together, like one of the joys of being in a hotel, right? And I said, you know what? I said, is the, is the manager around? I just have to understand this, right? This is baffling me. And I look back now and I laugh at how big of a deal I made this to myself and to the others. But I went down and I met the GM. I just walked down and I, I said, hey, I said, I said, you know, tell me, help me understand. Like, I was like, just, this is baffling me that they wouldn't do that. And I said, okay, look, he explained look, it's hotel policy. If we break something in the bag, then somebody complains about it. But I said, look, I, 
I have never walked a day in your shoes. I can imagine this policy was put in place for a reason. You probably had some really terrible situations. I totally get it. I said, hey, as a consumer, it would be great. And I just said, maybe you notify us and let us know. Or maybe there's a sign that says anything left on the bed, we won't be able to make your bed. I said, maybe that's just part of the process. Maybe this is a learning opportunity for all of us. And I got back up to the room and, hey, we ended great with the manager. It was all great. And I wasn't, you know, not screaming at anybody or acting like a total fool. But one thing that did happen, which is really funny, is as I'm like passionately explaining to the manager about this, this bag, um, I actually shared with him. I said, look, actually, what, what I think what I'm so passionate about is I'm so excited about making moments special for people. It's what I do for a living for Front Row Foundation, you know, and and our Front Row Dads, we always talk about making these Front Row moments. I just see these opportunities to make something awesome. And it kind of bugs me when it's not. And I said, so maybe this is just an opportunity, you know, for us all to, to grow from this. But um, the guy at the front desk goes, wait a minute, you're the you're the motivational speaker. And right when he said that, I, I really had to check in and I'm like, Am, am I the motivational speaker who's being a total ass right now? Who's like standing on stage, telling everybody to be positive, And yet here I am like, you know, um, you know, having this intense conversation with the manager in the lobby. And it just got me thinking that, you know, hey, look, there's always these times when people are watching, whether it's the guy at the front desk who knows you're the motivational speaker or it's your son who's watching you handle this. And like, was this an opportunity for me to teach the hotel how to be a better hotel? Or was I just being a little bit of a baby or a lot of a baby? You know, was I was I just not handling it with class? You know, I could have said that technically I said everything OK, like I didn't technically step over the line, but maybe my energy was just a little bit out of alignment with what I truly value. And did I speak with with calm clarity and interest and really without any judgment of the situation? Did did I exaggerate that? moment and the answer in the end for me was yeah like i was not proud of how i handled that even though if somebody would have a video camera like well everything you said was okay john like you you know you handled it well i energetically i still feel like there are moments like that where i failed so i was able to talk to tiger about hey i, I think i probably overdid it there <laughs> like and i just can i just opened up and was like hey you know here's another way i could have handled that you know but hey I'm, I'm tired and i made a mistake so i think what's really important is that when we catch ourselves making those mistakes we can just course course correct and that ended up being a great um final part of the trip so anyway guys look here's my grand takeaway from this whole thing every day there's value in spending 40 minutes with your kids right every day uh to do whatever it is with your kids 40 minutes and i'm just using that number as an example for this one particular uh you know idea i'm presenting so 40 minutes a day. There's also value in four hours, one-to-one -one time with every kid every quarter. That's the Jim Shields board meeting philosophy that so many of you practice, right? So four hours, one-to-one -one time every quarter. But there's also value in a four-day trip, one-to-one -one with your kids once a year. And if you have not scheduled this with your children, if you have not gotten an extended adventure, extended trip, just two of you, to go away and go through multiple days, right? Doing life together. I highly recommend it. Um, that's my big, uh, my big lesson for today is get away with each child one time a year for about four days or so. Go on an adventure. Have an epic time. Um, that's it for today's show, everybody. I hope this was of value. If you're having a great time listening to the Front Row Dads podcast, please let us know how we're doing on iTunes. Leave us a rating or review. Screenshot that. Send it to me. I'd love to send you a personal thank you. My email is john, J-O-N, at frontrowdads.com. Also, guys, we're opening up membership for Front Row Dads around Father's Day. We're going to open this up maybe two, maybe three times a year, probably twice a year, for guys to become members of the organization where we have these monthly calls. We get together. We talk. You get invites to our live retreats. If that's of interest to you, make sure to put your name and your email in at the website, frontroadads.com, so we can notify you when it opens. Uh, but that's it, guys. Get out there. Be epic family men. Thanks for listening today. And uh, again, share this episode, by the way. If, if you've got another dad that you think would value it, pass it along. We want to get this information out to as many people as possible. So really appreciate you guys being part of this brotherhood. Uh, join the conversation over on uh, Facebook, frontroadads.com slash Facebook. We'll get you right to the page. And there you can ask questions, offer up insights and whatever else to continue a great dialogue so we can serve our families at a higher level. Adios, boys. See ya.